People that knows that God, the people that know that God, they will be strong and do exploit. I, we be, I believe that the book of John will lead us more to know the Lord. So pray to God that he will give you opportunity to be here and take advantage of all the sessions because we want to do exploit. Let's pray. Bow your head. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessing you are giving to us today. We are here to receive from you. We ask you to send the great teacher, the Holy Spirit. First, let him prepare our heart, our mind, and prepare every session that we be available to receive from you. Father, we ask you to anoint the teacher as you're using him, Father. Open up everything that you had shown to him. Yes. Let it be available that we all may receive and do more exploit with you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to see everybody out in the house of the Lord tonight. And uh, I'm excited about the Bible class that we're getting ready to start, the Gospel according to John. It happens to be, how many is this your favorite of the four Gospels? How many have John as your favorite Gospel? Uh, I hold John as the highest. That's just my personal uh, preference, uh, just because of the way that he presents the material. But I'm looking for the Lord to really uh, give us some good things through the course of this Bible study. I would imagine we'll be in the book of John for the next... I don't know, 30 to 35 weeks, uh, because there's, there's some 22 chapters. I doubt that we can cover a chapter a night. Uh, but we're not going to try to rush it. We're not going to try to delay it. We'll just move little by little through it uh, because it's our hope that as we move through this that you gain a better knowledge uh, of the Word of God. And that's really our intention is that if, if you have to for some reason leave Christ and Vail Church or you move to another state or whatever the case, we want your time that you shared with us here to be a time in which you became more acquainted uh, with your Bible because you may leave from this church or you may leave and I don't see you anymore, but wherever you go, you're going to take your Bible with you, and we want you to have a better understanding of that, of that Bible. Uh, before we get into it, I want to make a couple of very quick announcements. As many of you know, we, um, we collected money from you some time ago to put a cross out in the front yard, uh, in, the, in the front of the building. Uh, and we had a lot of problems getting the cross. The first time the manufacturing plant burnt down and we called another one and their plant was burnt down and we think it was the same plant for two different vendors. Uh, but we, we, they finally have made the cross for us. They, they got it uh, dipped and painted and everything, and it shipped out this past Monday. So it's on the freight lines now. We anticipate we'll have it in the building by Monday, uh, by this coming Monday. And so once I have it in my possession, we'll get the contractors to come out and build the foundation up there, and we'll get it mounted. So we appreciate your pace, patience as we, as we work through all of that. Uh, also, out on the web page, we have all of the workbooks for this Bible class. Uh, if you go out to the, uh, to the sermon archives and, and click on this Bible class, uh, you'll find a, a section of workbooks there. There's a workbook per chapter. It's my personal notes that I took when I was preparing for this the first time we did this Bible study, and you're welcome to use that um, however you see fit. So let's get into the subject matter tonight. Oh, let me say this as well. Uh, we thank God for my new friend Rodney being with us tonight. We, we just met today, and he told me he was going to come out tonight, so we thank God that he's out. Make sure you shake his hand on the way out. Praise the Lord. Well, uh, if you may have noticed that in your Bible there are four Gospels. The Gospel is in there four times. Many people don't think about this, but the timing of the Gospel, the period of time that the Gospel covers is really in the Old Testament. Jesus lived under the Old Testament economy. The New Testament was not uh, ratified until Jesus said, it is finished, which is at the end of the gospel. So the, the most of the gospel, the story of the gospel is lived in the Old Testament covenant, in the Old Covenant. Uh, and you see in the new, that we have four of them, even though they're recorded in the New Testament, uh, Math, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, and you may wonder, why, why did the Holy Spirit put these, the gospel in the Bible four times? 
Well, why not just put it in there once and put all the parables together in one? Well, the reason is that each of these evangelists, they present the life and death and burial of Jesus Christ from a different perspective. For example, Matthew, he represents Jesus as the sovereign king. And when you notice, when you read Matthew, you'll notice in the opening chapter that Matthew starts all the way back with Abraham. And he begins to count the lineage up through David. And he counts the lineage all the way to Jesus Christ, showing that Jesus had a, a legal right to sit on the Davidic throne. Both Mary and David, uh, Mary and Joseph were direct descendants of David. And, and even in the natural lineage, Jesus has a right to sit on that throne. So Matthew presents Jesus as the sovereign king. Mark presents him as the suffering servant. And Luke presents him as the man Christ Jesus. John, though, is a little bit different. He represents him as God incarnate. And I think this is the reason that I like John so much. It's simple. It's not complex. It's very simple if you accept it that Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke... They are, are similar in the way that they are written. They are called synoptic gospels, synoptic gospels. They're called that because they are somewhat synonymous one with another. If you begin to do an analysis of the parables and the stories in these gospels, you'll find that there is a lot of overlap. In fact, some scholars think that these three evangelists, that they worked from a common document and added their own memory and their own uh, take on Jesus as they wrote it from a common document. It's so much alike. John is not one of the synoptic gospels. It, it is not like any of the rest of the gospels. In fact, in the very first phrase of the very first verse of the gospel of John, he takes the reader and launches him right out into eternity past. And if, as if that wasn't enough, not only does he launch him into eternity past, but he causes them to gaze down into the triune Godhead. So immediately it takes the feet out from under a person, and you can only proceed if you proceed through the eyes of faith. So let's just get started. Oh, we're going to do a quick survey over the first uh, several verses of this first chapter so that you get a sense of what we're going to look at. Verse 1 is going to show us the relationship of Jesus Christ to time and eternity. It will also show us the relationship of Jesus Christ to the Godhead. As we get down to verse 3, we'll see Jesus Christ's relationship to the universe as a whole. As we go down to verse 4 and 5, we'll see Jesus' relationship to mankind. And in the verses 6 through 9, we'll see his relationship to his elder cousin, John the Baptist. And again, John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. I believe it was a first cousin. And then in verses 10 through 13, we'll see Jesus' relationship to men on the planet of that day. Specifically, verse 10 will show that men knew him not. Verse 11 will show that his own received him not, the Israel as a whole received him not. And then finally in verse 12 and 13, that there is a small remnant and has always been a small remnant that would receive Jesus Christ. And uh, you and I, if you're saved here today, if you're covered in the blood of Jesus Christ, you are part of that small remnant of all of, of mankind that has actually received him. If you look at the planet today, there's some 7 billion people on the planet today. There's only a small segment of those that have actually accepted Jesus Christ, not the historical figure, but has accepted him as his atoning death for my personal sin has accepted him like that. It's only a small remnant. So we'll launch into verse one uh, just right off. It says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So we see then John just right off the bat, he launches all the way back to eternity. When you look at Mark, Mark starts with the birth of John the Baptist. When you look at Luke, Luke goes all the way back to the birth of the, uh, the Baptist by Zacharias and Elizabeth. When you look at Matthew, he goes all the way back to Abraham. 
But when you look at John, he goes all the way back to the beginning. He starts in the same place that Moses started when he wrote the book of Genesis. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. This term word is, is a little difficult for us in our English speaking to understand, but the Greek word is actually the logos. It means something that's spoken, including the thought. God's revelation of himself. Now, you have to understand that Jesus has always existed. He, he's always existed. The triune Godhead has always been a triune Godhead. But Jesus the son began to exist at the incarnation. Prior to the incarnation, he was the eternal logos, still God, still God, but had never put on human flesh, had never been born of a woman. And so John is pushing all the way back past uh, Mary's conception, past the birth of Jesus, all the way back to the beginning of time and says, in the beginning was the eternal logos, the eternal logos, uh, and the eternal logos was with God. And here it is in important phrase. And the word was God. This is one of the greatest evidences that we can find of Jesus Christ's deity. If you're going to believe the Bible, the word was God. Hebrew says that Jesus is the express image of the person of God is in fact, the brightness of his glory. So John starts us off. He doesn't make any apologies for it. He just starts it off point blank. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Now this is a powerful statement. Think about this. All things. All things were made by him. And, and quickly, we think about objects. We think about, did he make that chair? Yes, he made that chair. Did he make this stage? He made this stage. But every star in the heavens was made by Jesus Christ. The universe, billions and billions of miles going out, he made all of it. If you think about, if you could imagine in your mind what an atom looks like. An atom has a nucleus, and then there's a lot of space, and then there's some protons that, that, that fly around it. He not only made the, the nucleus and the protons, he made the space in between it. Space-time itself is made by Jesus Christ. It says, all things were made by him. The eternal logos is what it's talking about. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself here. All things were made by him, and without him, the Holy Spirit is inspiring John to make sure that we understand that without Jesus Christ, there was nothing made that is made. Nothing can exist except by the personal effort of Jesus Christ. And again, I think it's in Hebrews, it says that he sustains all things by the word of his power which is a remarkable thought, it means that while Jesus hung on the cross dying for the sins of mankind, that he was yet sustaining the entire universe while he himself died on the cross. Without him was not anything made that was made. When you think about what's being taught now in our school systems, and it has been for any amount of time, is this theory of evolution. How many's heard about it? How many, how many learned that in school, evolution? Uh, it is a theory, and it's not a very good one. But because there are scientists that are very well-spoken and seem to be very intelligent that are putting forth this theory, many people accept it when, in fact, it is simply a theory, and it's really not a very good one. It really doesn't make sense, as Darwin put it out, when you begin to really analyze it and investigate it. But the theory is that somewhere, uh, and I'll give you the condensed version, there was a tadpole. There was a germ that grew up to be a tadpole, that evolved to be a tadpole. And the tadpole at some point uh, crawled out of the water and became a bug. And the bug became a bird and, the bir and it just kept evolving until finally there was a monkey. And then the monkey grew into a better monkey. <laughs> and then the better monkey grew into a Neanderthal. And then finally, uh, man evolved into what he is today. That's, that's a short synopsis of what evolution teaches. 
And if that were the case, we would still, of course, be evolving into something else. But that's exactly opposite of the truth. Because the scripture said all things was made by him, nothing involved. When you look at Genesis, every single thing that was created, when he, made, when he made this animal, he put a seed within that animal to produce after its kind. Every, every plant has a seed within it to produce after its kind. You can't go across the kinds. And so the reality is that man is not evolving. Humanity is not evolving like this. But in fact, when God created Adam, he created Adam so marvelously so intelligent, such strength in his physical being, that even with sin pulling on his life from the time of the original sin, it took almost 1,000 years for Adam's body to be worn down that death could take it. So marvelously was he made. The reality is that, and the scripture says concerning man, for thou hast made him, speaking of man, a little lower than the angels. This is Psalms 8 and 5. Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. And when you look up the word angels in the original Hebrew, you find that word is Elohim, which is the word for God. Meaning that God made man just a little bit lower than himself. Not, not starting at the very bottom and evolving up, but he made him, his mind was like a steel trap. Adam was able to name all of the animals giving them a name that encompassed their, their personality and their characteristics and was able to remember all of the names one from another. Now, if you and I, if we just go to the zoo, <laughs> we can't remember the names of the animals. So I put forth that it's not an evolution that is occurring, but it's the exact opposite. God made man as a, as a, as a supreme um, showing of his power and his creative force and man has devolved and is devolving and will continue to devolve all the way down to the point of a beast. Doesn't mean that we change our, our bodily features, but our mentality is changing. Our minds are changing. It used to be that men lived for a thousand years, 900 years, 800 years. You read those first generations in, in Genesis, they, they lived for hundreds of years. If we live for 100 now, we're blessed. Meaning that man is not evolving, but rather is devolving. And so I, was, I would say this as, you know, if you're in a public school system or a school system that's teaching evolution, uh, be kind, uh, but understand it is a theory. Uh, that's all that it is. Uh, your Bible is the, is the authority. <laughs> the Bible is not a theory, it's an authority. And so uh, keep that in balance. Verse 4 then says concerning Jesus Christ, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Meaning that in Jesus Christ in life, and anything that has life in the known universe got that life from Jesus Christ. He is the author and the finisher. There's nothing that's, every bug uh, on the planet got his life from Jesus Christ. Every human being got his life from Jesus Christ. If it's living, it got its life from Christ. In him, and him alone is life, and that life was the light of men. Meaning that in the life of Jesus Christ, he gave us both physical life, which we need if, if the sun goes out, all life on this planet ceases to exist. He gave us both physical life, but he also gave us moral life, uh, light. I'm sorry, I'm saying life, light. He also gave us moral light, meaning that when we receive the light of Christ, we begin to be able to be make better moral decisions. If you ever wonder why the world is the way that it is, if you ever wonder in your mind, how could it be uh, that, that people now are confused about which gender they are? It's because they're in darkness, moral darkness. And if you ever wonder how could it be that people are confused about what a marriage is supposed to be or what a family is supposed to be, it's because the moral light is turned out as man continues to devolve. 
But when you come to Jesus, and I remember this, I've been saved now just over 30 years, and I remember my life was upside down. I was out there wide open. But when I got saved, having no religious background, I didn't know anything about Jesus. One day he just saved me. And when I got saved, all of a sudden I realized it was like I had been my whole life in a closet with the lights out. And then in one moment, somebody turned on the lights. And all of a sudden, I could see all of these things that I was not able to see, moral things. The way I was living, all of, all of a sudden, I could see, well, this isn't right what I'm doing. How, how I've been conducting myself is not right because the light was turned on. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined into darkness, meaning that the moral light of Christ shined into the darkness of man's situation because of the fall. The light shined in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The word comprehended in the Greek it simply means uh, to apprehend, to seize, or to possess, or to overcome. The light shined into the darkness, and the darkness overcame it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, this is not talking about the apostle John. This is talking about John the Baptist. Sent of God. God sent him. And, and as you go back and you read, I believe you'll find it in the book of Luke, that before John was ever born, God had already given his parents their name. His name will be called John. And he was anointed before he was ever born because God sent him to be the forerunner for Jesus Christ. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, and again, the light is referring to Jesus Christ. That so that all men through him might believe. Now, I look at John the Baptist and as an example of what every preacher should be, and really what every Christian should be. His humility, his purpose, uh, his his refusal to lift himself up in any way. Uh, is an example to all of us. It says the same. Speaking of John, came to bear witness. Uh, of the light that all, so that all men through him might believe. You and I really are the same type of witnesses that John was. It's through our witness of Jesus Christ that other men might be able to believe. When we go out and we tell people about what we've seen, what we've discovered in Christ, and they begin to give their hearts and life to Christ, we're doing the same function that John the Baptist did. And it's important that we do that function as it was for John. Uh, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light. Oh, this is so important, saints. You and me are not that light. I am not that light. When you, when you tell people about Jesus Christ, don't tell people about your pastor. Tell people about Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, don't necessarily tell them about Christ Unveiled Ministries. Tell them about Jesus Christ. Here's the reality. You don't have to go find a sinner that's in trouble and bring him here to this altar to get him saved. He can get saved right where you met him at. R right where you're at. You can hold his hands and personally you can introduce him to Jesus Christ right there. If you know Jesus Christ, you can introduce Jesus Christ to someone else. And so it's not about a man. It's not about a church. And and John says of uh, uh, John the Baptist, he was not that light, but was merely sent to bear witness of that light. And you and I have to remember this. No preacher is that light. It doesn't matter how, what recognition he has. It doesn't matter how big his ministry has. There's only one true light, and it's Jesus Christ. Verse 9 and 10 says, uh, speaking of Jesus, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Now again, it says, uh, the first phrase, speaking of Jesus, that was the true light. Jesus is the true light. And as much as the Holy Spirit inspired him to say true light, it lets us know that there's also a false light that's out there. And as a matter of fact, there, there are many false lights. There are many false illuminaries. There are many false religions. But Jesus is the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Speaking of Jesus, he was in the world, meaning that the eternal logos, the infinite being who had always been here through eternity past, 
he, he came into this world. The creator came inside of his creation. He was in the world and the, and the world was made by him. But yet the world didn't even recognize him. Never, never mind that he was raising the dead. Never mind that he was casting out devils everywhere that he went. That he did miracles beyond anything that anyone had ever seen. No one considered that God has become one of us and is walking amongst us. And, and let's be honest. We have the perspective of 2,000 years of history. But had we been there at that time and somebody told you that the creator of everything. Yeah, he's right there. He can't. He's, he's dwelling amongst us. He's walking amongst us. Could you imagine what a challenge that would be? Could you imagine what a challenge it was for Jesus' biological brothers and sisters or, or, or Mary's children when they began to have to realize that, you know, we realize Jesus was always different from the rest of us. He never got in trouble or anything. But he's actually God. He's actually God in the flesh. What a challenge that would be to try to wrap your head around that. He was in the world and the world was made by him, yet the world knew him not. This is the relationship and quite frankly, even tonight, the world still knows him not. The, the world doesn't know him any better today than it did 2,000 years ago. It goes on to say he came into his own, meaning that he came to Israel. He came to the, the, the sons of Jacob, of, of which lineage he came through. He came into his own, and his own received him not. That is the understatement of the Bible. It's not just that Israel did not receive him. I, they, they whipped him and nailed him to a tree. They cast him off this planet through, through the transport of death. They threw him out through death to, to be no longer a man. So it's not just that they received him not. They fully rejected him. And to this very day, continue as Israel as a nation continues to reject Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And they will not realize that the one whom they crucified really was their Messiah until they cast their allegiance with the false Messiah who is the Antichrist. And, and, and their nation and their people are destroyed. They'll realize that the scripture said they'll look upon the one whom they had pierced and realize that we've made a mistake. He came unto his own and his own received him not. All but as many as received him. To them and to them only gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, you might wonder, well, what do you have to do to receive him? How do you receive Jesus Christ? Well, this scripture, these verses are telling us the phrase received him is synonymous in the way it's being used with believing on his name. And believing on his name doesn't just believe that his name is Jesus, but, but it's basically believing in everything that his name stands for. His sacrificial death, his atonement for the sins of mankind. So to receive him is to believe on his name. Uh, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. If you're saved today, male or female, you're covered in the blood, you are considered a son of God. Meaning that you have been adopted into the family of God. God has always wanted, the reason he made Adam in the garden is because he wanted a creation of sons of God. But because of the fault, and it's not, don't, don't say, well, hold it, I'm female, women's rights. It's, it's just a word, just, just accept it. <laughs> and you really don't want to be a daughter of God because in this culture, daughters got no inheritance. Zippo, none. But, but sons got inheritance, so thank God that you too are considered a son of God and you, have, you are heir and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Um, so he gave them power to be sons of God. God has always wanted a creation of sons. If you look at this in the book of, um, let's see, I think it's in Luke. Yes, in Luke. And chapter 3. This is giving us the lineage uh, the, the, of, of the humanity of Christ. And I'm just going to just jump in right at 23. It goes on 
I think 77 generations, but uh, verse 23 says, and Jesus himself began to be about the 30 years of age, being as it was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli, which was the son of Mathat, which was the son of Levi, which was the son of Melchi, which was the son of Janai, which was the son of Joseph. It just jumped down to 38. The generations just keep going and going. Just jump down to 38. Which was the son of Enos. This is going all the way back in time. Which was the son of Seth. Which was the son of Adam. Speaking of the first Adam. Which was the son of God. So when Adam was created, God created him to be a son of God. And it was, it was God's intention that when Adam began to procreate with Eve, that Seth would have been also a son of God. And that the whole creation would have produced sons of God. That was God's intention in the beginning. But because of original sin, when Adam and Eve began to have children, they didn't bring forth sons of God. They brought forth sons of Adam. And if you look at Genesis chapter 5, you'll see this. Genesis chapter 5. And verse 3 says that Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness. Not in the likeness of God, but in his own likeness and after his own image and called him Seth. So the fall in the garden, it wrecked the plan of God for, to have a creation of sons of God. But God had a better plan in Jesus Christ in that as many as that received him, he would give power to become sons of God, meaning that simply your faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ causes God to adopt you. You're an adopted son of God. He brought you into the family anyway. He cleansed you from all your sins. He wiped away all your iniquity and he established you now as a son of God. It, it's a spiritual, uh, it's spiritual, it does, if two Christians have a, a baby, that baby doesn't get born saved. Are you with me? That baby has to make a personal decision for Jesus Christ himself. And at that point, they are adopted into the family of God. And God has his intention of having sons of God, both male and female. Verse 13 says, and again, this is speaking of the sons of God, which were, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So it says, these that uh, were given power to become sons of God, they were born not of blood, meaning that uh, the status of sons of God, it does not follow a human bloodline. It, and it never has. You can have, you can have um, one brother that has a heart towards the Lord and have another brother that doesn't want anything to do with God. So it has nothing to do with natural bloodlines. It has nothing to do with racial bloodlines. It is a spiritual thing which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, S simply meaning that God doesn't, doesn't get any input from man as to who gets saved and who doesn't. That person makes a decision based on faith as to whether they'll believe Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and that's the end of it. Man can't legislate it. Man can't hand out permits for it. He can't tax it. He can't do anything about it. It's not of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but it's a God thing. And the Word was made flesh. Now, you remember back in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word that was God was made flesh. He's talking about the incarnation. That at some point in time when, when the Lord had decided the time was right, there's a little baby that was born in Bethlehem. <laughs> and you look, look at how Christ came into this world. He's God. He's an infinite being. He has lived eternally. But he came into this world, birthed into a family of peasants. Born in a, in a barn. <laughs> Not in a castle. 
I would imagine Joseph would have to push the cow manure out of the way so that Mary could give birth to this little baby. Laid him in a, a, a manger. A manger is a hog trough. It's a, it's a cow trough where cows eat straw out of. That's what a manger is. That's how the word, the eternal logos, was made flesh and began his sojourn among us as the humblest. As, as the humblest. And saints, he did it as an example to you and I. See, as a Christian, we shouldn't want the positions, the high and mighty positions. We should just want to live peaceably in Christ Jesus and have fellowship with him. The word was made flesh and he dwelt amongst us. He walked amongst us. The eternal God, almighty God, who's able to walk out into pitch black nothing and simply say, let there be light. And light shines forth out of darkness at 186,000 miles a second and has not stopped stretching out across the universe from the time that God said, let there be light. This one with that kind of power, who's able to know all the stars in the heaven and call them all by their unique individual name. This God was made flesh and began to walk the dusty streets of Palestine, dwelt amongst us. And over the next several chapters, we'll begin to see as we behold his glory, which is the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. You don't have to read a whole lot of, of the Gospels to begin to see the graciousness of God. I mean, you and I, just, just in our own lives, look back at how long you've been saved, whether it's one year, five years, ten years, doesn't matter. And just look at how many times you've messed up. You and me both have just messed up, but yet a gracious and loving God has simply said, hey, if you will just confess your sin, I will forgive your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And then on top of that, because if you realize it or not, you and I are perpetual mess ups. We mess up often. Come on, somebody. We, we mess up often. So here's what he said. I will put my Holy Spirit in you and he will help to sanctify you. He will help to mature you, to cause you not to make as many mess ups. And if, you're, if you've been saved any amount of time, you still may not be all the way delivered, but you can look back and see, I'm not doing that no more. There's some other things back there. That, that's not part of my life. He's changing us little by little. Oh, what a gracious God we say we serve. Full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is, pref is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. So the Baptist is, is crying out in the wilderness, and he's saying that, uh, speaking of Jesus, this is whom, uh, he of whom he had been preaching about. He that cometh after me, and again he's saying Jesus came after John because John is about six months older than Jesus, and, it, and Jesus is his younger cousin. And if you go back into Luke, you can see where that is. Uh, Elizabeth was pregnant for about six months before Mary even got pregnant uh, by the Holy Spirit. So John the Baptist uh, is his older cousin. So he's saying, he that cometh after me, Jesus was born after John the Baptist, but yet he's preferred before me, simply saying that Jesus has preeminence over John, even though he came afterwards. Because and, well, the next phrase says it, is preferred before me because he was before me. So the Baptist is realizing and acknowledging that Jesus Christ did not begin to exist in, in Bethlehem's major, manger, but he existed in eternity past. He was before me. Before John was ever conceived, Jesus had already lived for eons as the eternal God. And of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. Now, this is a, a critical verse right here, and you got to catch this. It says, for the law was given by Moses. 
The law is that body of legislation that was given to Moses when he went up on Sinai and he spent 40 days in the presence of God. And God gave him a full uh, body of legislation. He gave him the moral law. He gave him the ceremonial law. And he gave him the Levitical process of worship. All of that was given to Moses. And he came down after 40 days off of the mountaintop. And he had the two tablets of stone with the Ten Commandments on them. And as he came down, he heard the camp. And he began to realize that under the leadership of the first high priest Aaron, that Israel had made itself naked and it was having orgies and worshiping a golden calf. And when, when Moses found out, he said, you that are with me, gird up your swords and anyone you find involved in this calf worship, kill them. The very day that the law was given to mankind, 3,000 men died as a result of their, their calf worship. That's what the law does. Listen, the law cannot, the law can't be fair with you. The law only does one thing. If you're doing well, the law says nothing to you. The law doesn't get engaged until you break it. In other words, if you're going down the street, if the speed limit is 45, there could be a police on either side of the road. As long as you're doing the speed limit, they, they will not say nothing to you. But if you cut down that road with doing 70, now you've just engaged the law. And, and when you've engaged them, uh, you, you, they're, they're going to be hard on you. There's only one thing they can do. They write you the ticket. And when you, when you go to court, there's only one thing they can do. Pay the ticket. Or go to jail. That's the law. It's, it's unbending. 3,000 men died the day the law was given. But if you will read the book of Acts and look at the first inaugural message given in the New Testament from the time that Jesus died, Peter gave the inaugural message. And at the end of that message, you will find 3,000 people received eternal life. Now, that's the difference between law and grace. It's the difference between law and grace. How many has ever been, spent any time in your life caught up in legalism? Legalism? Anybody? <laughs> it is a brutal taskmaster. But grace is just the goodness of God extended. You know, I, I get a little bit vexed when I hear uh, people say, ter use terminology like greasy grace. You know, it's like you could, you're, you're saying you want grace so you can just do every, anything you want to do. No, if you got the Holy Ghost, you ain't doing anything you want to do. Because the Holy Ghost is, is convicting you. The Holy Ghost is challenging you. He's trying to grow you. It doesn't mean you're perfect. But it does mean that the Holy Spirit is leading you and guiding you and maturing you. And let's just face it. There's some things you will just not do. You'll just, no matter how many times you've done, there's some things, those things, you just won't do them no more because the Holy Ghost has helped you. So the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth, it came by Jesus Christ. God's always been a gracious God. He was a gracious God before the flood. He just did not reveal how gracious he was until the, until the sin debt could be removed. And he could give a further revelation of himself. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Truth is what Christ gave by his life. Grace is what he gave by his death. In other words, when he was here, he spoke the truth. And he spoke it straight. And when he died on the cross, it allowed the graciousness of God to flow into our lives and into our hearts. It goes on in verse 18 to say, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. No man has seen God at any time. Now, sometimes when you're reading your Bible, you need to have a Bible dictionary behind you, and you need to look up some of the words that it seems like you already know what that means. The word seen, it's a very common word. It seems like we would automatically know what that word means, but the Greek word for seen uh, is different than what you would think. The Greek word actually means to discern clearly, to fully comprehend. No man has seen God. No man has fully comprehended God at any time. 
And of course, that makes sense because God is an infinite being. And the only way that you can fully comprehend an infinite being is you got to have an infinite mind to do that. You and I are disqualified. So he's not saying no one has ever laid eyes on God. He's saying that no one has ever fully comprehended him again because he is an infinite uh, personality. However, these scriptures that I have written here, these scriptures are where men have laid their eyes on God and actually looked at him. And there, there, there's many accounts of We know this same evangelist, John, who wrote this gospel, he saw him sitting in the throne. He described the throne as being emerald in color and the four living creatures in front of it. He saw him. He looked upon him. Moses actually uh, saw him several times. And one time Moses and the elders of Israel went up into the mountain and they had dinner with God. Has anybody ever read that? That's in your Bible. Genesis 18 too, I believe it is. Abraham saw God. When, when the angels came to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham, uh, God stayed back and they talked to, and he talked to Abraham. Ezekiel saw him. Daniel saw him. So there's many men that have seen him in terms of laying their eyes upon him, but there's none that have fully comprehended him uh, because he's more than our brains can take. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he hath declared him. Now, the implication here is that the only begotten Son, the, the Son of God, He has fully comprehended the Father. You say, well, how could that be? Because the Father is an infinite being. Oh, yes, but the Son is also an infinite being. And so He has fully comprehended the Father and come to declare what He saw to you and I. If you ever want to know what the Father is, what kind of personality He has, what His attitude is, look at Jesus Christ. He is the express image of the person of God. If you ever wonder, well, what, 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 what would the father do if, if he saw someone that was lame? Well, look at what Jesus did. What, what would the father do if, if he saw a horrible sinner come and stand in front of him and, and, uh, and, and, and say, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I've lived wrong? Well, look at what Jesus did. He is the expressed, the expressed image of God. He hath declared him. And this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Now again, here's another place that we see the beautiful example that John the Baptist lays out for you and I. Um, Malachi was the last prophet to speak in Israel. That the close of the Old Testament was with the prophet Malachi. When John appeared, there had not been a prophetic utterance in Israel for 400 years. For 400 years. John, being the son of a priest, Zacharias, he had full rights to work in the temple. To be one of the priests that would work in the temple on their rotation. But John rejected the organized religion of that day. He went out into the wilderness. He ate wild locusts and honey. He wore a leather girdle. But he had the power of God upon him. And people were coming out of the cities to come to John as he taught them how to live. As he taught them how to repent. How to prepare the way for the coming king. And so the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem, meaning these are the, the high mucky mucks of organized religion of that day, to ask John, who are you, man? Now, the thought here is that they knew that it was in the season that the Messiah was supposed to come. Just like you and I, we know that we're in the season that the rapture of the church is going to occur. We're just not sure when it's going to be, but we're definitely in the season. So they sent him out to ask him, who are you? And here's what John did. First prophetic voice to speak in 400 years. The crowds are swelling large. He's got recognition from the highest order of organized religion of that day. All eyes are upon him. They say, who, who are you? Implying, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? And John says, I am not the Christ. Well, isn't it wonderful? And wouldn't it be wonderful if we had more preachers that would just say, man, I'm not the one. Don't, don't look at me. Don't, don't look at me. I'm trying to serve Jesus Christ just like you are. 
But so many times we have preachers that allow the people to hold them up as a demagogue. As though, as though it's like Christ and then the preacher and then the people. But the reality is the, pre the preacher fits right in with the people. He's, he's one of them, including myself. So John said, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elias? Because one of the things that Malachi has said is that uh, Elijah would come before the great and notable day of the Lord. That's one of the last things that Malachi said. And they knew that uh, Elijah, one like him, would be the forerunner to Christ. And so they asked him, well, if, if you're not Christ, well, surely you got to be Elijah. John said, I am not. They said, well, are you that prophet? Because going all the way back to Moses, Moses said that the Lord would raise up another prophet like unto me that would lead the people. And so these that came from Jerusalem, they said, okay, are, you're not the Christ? Okay, well, well, are you Elijah? No? Well, surely you must be the prophet. And here's what they're getting at, is that you've got to be one of these people because if you're not one of them, who told you you could baptize out here? Whose authority are you out here baptizing under? Do you see the, the overreaching uh, attitude of the organized religion of that day? They're trying to find out if you're not one of these three entities that we were expecting, we didn't give you permission to be out here baptizing. Because when you baptize, it meant that you're coming out of one type of religion, Judaism, and you're being baptized into another type. And so their question is, who told you you could preach to our people? Who told you you could, you could baptize our people? He said, no. Then said they unto him, well, who are you then? That we might give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? Say, who do you think you are if you're not one of these three that we've been expecting? And oh, here's this humility of John. He said, I'm the voice, I'm just a voice, of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. So he's not, he's not building himself up to be anybody. He, he comes just as lowly and humble as he possibly can. No, I'm not Jesus. I'm not Elijah. I'm not that prophet. Man, I'm just a voice. I'm just a voice. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees, and they asked him and said unto him, and this, you can tell the attitude right here, why baptizest thou then if thou be not that Christ, nor Elijah, neither that prophet? I, give me just two more minutes. Okay, we'll stop there. I thought I was closer. <laughs> I thought I was closer. Uh, I've run out of time tonight. I hope that, that you've gotten something out of this. There's some wonderful revelations in this, uh, in this gospel. And so we invite you to come back out next week. Uh, and we'll pick up right here. And we'll just move forward from there. Amen. Would you please receive our offering tonight? Amen. <laughs> Thank you for watching the Christ Unveiled Ministries broadcast. We're so glad you are a part of the service today. We trust God has ministered to your heart through today's teaching. Our ministry is supported 100% through donations from people like you. Please consider supporting Christ Unveiled Ministries by going to the bottom of ChristUnveiled.org and clicking the Donate button. Your donation will help us reach around the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. To watch more sermons like this, select Resources, then Sermons Archive. God bless, and we will see you next time.